everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome, welcome. Lovely to see you all. I'm Carol Annett from Country and Townhouse magazine. Delighted to be here with Guy Oliver, Sam Todd Hunter, and Susie Hoodless. Um, all exceptional interior designers. And uh, we're going to be chatting about maximalism and design exuberance. Um, so, Guy, I'm going to start with you. How do you express exuberance um, in an interior? What, do, what does it mean to you? Well, first of all, you've got it, you're working with this mysterious thing called the client. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the client may not exactly know what they want. But sometimes you're lucky and they have a wonderful collection of furniture or art or objects or elements that have been sort of collected or curated over time. And that's almost a gift to a designer because you're, you've got something to start from. It's something you can hang your scheme around and, and make, it, make it make sense. Sometimes collections can be too overpowering. So if somebody's got a collection of Staffordshire dogs and um, you know, five or six might be good, but then when you're getting up to 40 or 50, it might be overbearing. And I think it, the designer is the person that comes in and gives a sort of a cool view of what they're presented with and they help rationalize it and make it into something that they can live with and that other people will will be able to enjoy as well. So it's it sometimes it's a it comes down to editing rather than putting things in. Yeah. Editing is a really good thing. I mean, I I do a lot of hotel work and one of the things that goes further with hotels, boutique hotels in particular, is often they've got furniture from previous incarnations of of the hotel and it's nice to upcycle something painting a piece a horrible piece of neo edwardian furniture and changing the color of it can make it look wonderful and also you get more bang for your buck because you're you're able to be inventive and creative with other things and then layer in your design on top and that that's a really lovely thing to do because you're you're being sustainable and you're also you know giving a life and a history so th it's always nice to have that layering uh, in an interior um, because they um, it cre creates a sense of, of, of permanence and something that's evolved over time. So. Um, and Susie, what, I mean, sometimes I'm guessing you're working with elements that the client is bringing in, but some, for something like the Albright Club, um, one of your projects in, yeah. in West One, I know that you've um, got some beautiful colored lacquers in there. Yeah, so Albright um, is a, a women's only private members club in Mayfair and very much the brief was that it should be home from home for the members to uh, go and spend lunch or the day uh, either working, socializing, networking um, uh, or being in a bar or one of the restaurants uh, at the club and the idea was that it just felt um, felt really exciting and that, that, you know, it's not a home. So it doesn't, it's not a space that has to be lived in all the time. So we could sort of push it more. Um, I also think um, that there was a discussion from the client about it um, being uh, aesthetically beautiful and a social media uh, attractive, which All is right. the first time I've had Ins that, that brief, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid Instagrammable definitely was part of the brief, which completely horrified me to begin with. But actually, what it meant was that it, it, um, it looked great. I just kind of took it as being, you know, that, that it had to sort of look great. So we, we, we sort of really pushed it. And because it's near Savile Row, where you are, Guy, um, you know, there was, and it's I'm a women's only, it. we really, and we're all in our kind of tweed <laughs> coats. But, um, we really sort of pushed the whole theme of, of um, you know, the, the sort of Savile Row uh, textiles and, and fabrics. Um, and then things like the lacquered ceiling, you know, we had these kind of amazing jewel-like bathrooms. Um, and it was, a, you know, about sort of getting lots of decoration, lots of color, um, and making them really, uh, really kind of special rooms. So you walked in and just thought, Oh, this is great! This is really exciting. I feel I feel good in this space, and I want to be here. Um, and, and Sam, what, when when a client comes to you, how do you know how far to push that um, push the gear stick in 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 making something that going quite over the top? I mean, often the brief is going to give you a hint as to how far you can get your client to. Yeah. I will always though 
they come to you for a reason. They come to you because they might they have a sort of a, a vision, kind of what they want, but they're coming to you to kind of take them a little bit outside their comfort zone, to push them in terms of materials, colors, uh, style. So um, I kind of just go into first gear, then I go into second, <laughs> and as fast as possible get to seventh, and <laughs> I see, you know, uh, what we can achieve. But obviously you've got to be careful, you don't want to push them too far, so it's, it is a fine balance, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's about just leading them, it's a journey, essentially. Um, one, of the th one of the lovely elements of your country house, um, which I'm, is probably on your website, is that those incredible leopards going up the stairs. I mean, that's quite a, um, quite a, a thing to do in, in your own home. Well, it's quite a funny story because my husband is <coughs> incredibly traditional. And when we started doing the house, he said, yeah, we could do a sort of Axminster up the stairs. And I <laughs> went, um, okay. And then one day I said, how about leopards? And um, he <laughs> went, okay. And we did the leopards. And what's interesting, and I think maximalism is about this, it's about mixing unexpected elements together. So we're in a grade two star listed house, for example, and what you might expect to see going up the stairs, maximalism equals to give you what you're not expecting and, and to really push the, the clash, if you like. And, and that is what was fun about doing yeah. that. And they are enormous leopards. Uh, I mean, literally taking up kind of six or seven steps. Steps. Yeah, yeah we um, spent hours sort of placing the paws and where the, the tail mm. curls on the landing, particularly, it was, it was, a, it was a, a, a process. And he loves it. Absolutely <laughs> loves it. <laughs> Absolutely loves it. Yeah, no, it's yeah. great. Edward James had the house at West Dean. I don't know, they probably know this story, but his mistress was someone called Tilly Losh, and he saw her wet footprints on the carpet <laughs> going up the stairs, and he wove her f wet footprints and the dog's wet footprints into the staircase carpet going up into the house. And then when she ran off with the gardener, um, <laughs> <laughs> he had the carpet rewoven with just the dog's footprint. <laughs> and he said the dog was entirely more faithful than his ex-lover. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe the um, husband will take the leopards <laughs> out <laughs> of my carpet if I do a runner, <laughs> which I won't. But, uh. um, when we think of um, exuberance, we, we, you think about something like leopard print or um, a joyful wallpaper. I mean, there are th there are some um, companies that do it particularly well. I'm thinking of sort of Cole and Son, and quite often there's a uh, as a feeling that you use it in your downstairs cloakroom. I mean, are there so are there certain rooms where you think, yeah, this is where I'm going to have more fun? I think if a client is in any way anxious about doing a big, huge statement in their drawing room. The, the powder room is the place to do it, where yeah. you can get away with it. It's not somewhere people are in all the time. Um, I would prefer to do it in the, yeah, you just know, say no. the bigger yeah. scheme, <laughs> yes, yes. But I think, Sam, going back to your point, I think it's, it's, it evolves. Yeah. And I yeah. think once you get to that point where your client trusts, trusts you, you, that's you, the you, you move yeah. fast, yeah. don't you? Very fast, yeah, yeah. Very fast, and, and you're off. And I think once they get the trust, they're receptive to your ideas. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, they're going to be a bit, no, I want it this way. Yeah. But what the, more, the more trust they have in you, even down to attending site meetings when you don't need to, or just, yeah. just detail like that and helps, and, and hopefully anything goes. And commercial interiors, you're allowed to get away, I mean, commercial in as much as a boutique hotel or a wonderful bar. So <coughs> somewhere like Annabelle's, for example, you, it's very thrilling and fun to go there, but you wouldn't want to live in it. And um, it's, it's a bit of fantasy, and I think people enjoy that. And I think bars and clubs and you know, those sort of spaces are where you can be more expressive and you can mm. create something fun, and it gives something different to people when they, they go. It's whimsical and joyful, and, and there's a bit of theater that they probably couldn't bear it all the time. And it's lovely to be able to play with a, you know, a, a bar interior or a, or a restaurant interior and do something along those lines to give a bit of and atmosphere. And do you, do you think that because of where we've, we've been with the pandemic and everything, I don't know, um, maybe Susie, have you found that 
clients have come to you wanting to push the boundaries a little bit? Or, or do you think that um, that sort of whimsy and eccentricity is, is a particularly um, British thing? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily specific to British at all. If, in, in fact, if anything, uh, less British, because I think interior design, um, certainly when I started, um, set up 21 years ago, um, most of my clients were European and American, not, not English, so uh, interior designers were kind of less used. But um, I think that, um, yeah, I, I think I think that scale is a really important thing, actually, and, and something maybe that needs, and, and, and rhythm. And I think you need, a, you need a rhythm and a pace throughout a house. And you need, you know, you can't have every room looking kind of completely crazy. Um, and there has to be, uh, you know, every room has to work together, but, but you, need, you need change. Um, so I think it is kind of combining materials and, and changing scale and, and having, having confidence. Um, and I think people, I always think people are much better at kind of knowing what they um, want to wear. And maybe, you know, I used to go and look in clients' wardrobes because actually, oh, really? you know, is their wardrobe all kind of one simple neutral palette or is it bright colors or are they wearing pattern? And that's a really good fast indication of, um, you know, who they are. Yeah. And, 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 and I guess it's not just in, um, you know, I even, if you're, if, even if you adore a neutral, natural palette, you, you can still bring in different elements, like you say, when it comes to, to scale or texture. That's, yeah. where you, that's where you have your playfulness. Well, that's what makes it fun, I think, doesn't it? Is that mm -hmm. it is layering, and are, are we kind of amping the volume up here or down here? And, you know, I think that's where the creativity comes. And humor is important as well, otherwise it's... I think yeah. defining maxim ma maximalism is quite difficult, but I think it's made up of a few elements. It's about material, I, you know, high gloss, matte, cut velvet, satin, marble, stone, and... and pushing all that together, it, Annabelle's being a really good example, mm. you know, it's just so out there, it's fantastic. Um, so, and you can handle it in a practical way as well. Um, yeah. But also people, I mean, I think the British aren't necessarily more exuberant or expressive than say an Argentine or an Italian, but they do collect things and that can be an eccentricity as well. And yeah. you, you know, those things have to sometimes be built into interiors. And that can be um, challenging. You were saying about your collector in Albany, I see the At project. Albany, yeah. yeah. We just yeah. finished a project um, yeah. last year in, uh, in Albany. And, and the client, there was a quite a sort of macabre theme. So um, running through it, so, and there's kind of taxidermy. And we just, and, and it evolved. You know, the, what the, the brief at the beginning was quite a sort of, you know, generic. He showed me images of, of some gentlemen clubs and I thought okay fine and actually as it evolved it became much more eccentric as he he found his kind of confidence I think and as we pushed him and and as Sam said it, you know it's finding that point where you know occasionally you present something and you know you've gone too far and you've got to sort of pull <laughs> it back a bit but but you know and that's that's the exciting bit isn't it just finding that sort of boundary I, th I think probably the most publicly accessible maximalist interior is the Sony Museum so if you look mm. at that, and there are literally layers and layers of paintings behind panelled walls that you open up, and because there was so much stuff, they can't get it all in. And I think that's a good example of a collection that's kind of overtaken a house, and um, and is very it's very British British um, taste. I think. So mm. Susie, how how do we make it work then when you're mixing different periods and styles? What's the key to to binding it together? Well, I think it's buying good design. And, and following your instinct. And I think you need, I think you, you, there's no sort of shortcut with most of what we do. I think you need to know what you're looking at. You need to understand provenance. Um, and then beyond that, I think really, you know, understand your client, but, but really just create a personality and, and an interior that is totally unique to them. You're telling a story, and even if it's an invented story, it's a story, and you're yeah. trying to create something for that brief, and, and that's the important mm. part of it. It's very, um, it takes a lot of curation to be a good maximalist. Like, 
it looks effortless. Mm -hmm. the, the combination of, of styles, the combination of fabrics, the combination of colors, it does look effortless. You mm -hmm. want to walk in instantly and you yep. feel fabulous mm -hmm. in, in all these rooms. But it in fact is a very, I it's not effortless, it's, it's highly curated. Yep. Um, and I find that really interesting. It's not just about, okay, we're just gonna throw all this stuff in a pile and yeah. it's all gonna miraculously work. It so won't, it's, it's really a, a, a process. Yeah. Um, and knowing what you're putting together. One of the nicest briefs I had from a client was make this look like it's been in continuous ownership since it was built. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> interesting. That was quite yeah. a challenge, but it was, you know, he wanted to look like there's a continuity over 90 years. I mean, that was an interesting brief. Yeah. And, and we succeeded, but it was, you know, most people walk in and they think it's evolved over time, but it, it hasn't. It was done in two years. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I also I, I think exactly you you want interiors to to look like they've been there forever, and you want them to last a long time. Yeah. So uh, even if you have installed <laughs> it, uh, you know, in yeah, a matter of exactly, yeah. Yeah. you know, it should it has to stand the test of time. And I I also feel like I can't do it unless I follow every single step of the way, and I know what exactly what we're going to get. You know, I, we we follow very kind of clear systems, you know, we see everything. Um, and I also quite often wake up, uh, hopefully early in the morning, not middle of the night, and I've worked something out in my yeah. sleep. Yeah. And so there is a process and you have to sleep on it and it does evolve and it, it's not necessarily sort of sitting in your studio that, that you can do that. You do, and you don't do it at 100 miles an hour, it's something that does evolve. It percolates. I often, it? I keep a notebook by my bed because yeah. I do wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah. I think <laughs> right, so I write something down. And have any of you ever had a situation where actually you've had to rein a client in? So <laughs> they're, they're the ones with the sort of crazy I had ideas. Um, I had a client in San Francisco and they had uh, this huge space, sort of lower ground, opening onto a garden. And on the architect's plans, it said gym. And so I said to her, I said, so what would you want of your gym? Are we doing a sprung floor? Do we want a ballet bar? Is it going to be mirror everywhere? She said, gym, are you joking? And we made a karaoke room. <laughs> and it was like the most fun and the most maximalist <laughs> madness ever. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, I've had the opposite. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to go and look at a house in Surrey, which belonged to quite a well-known person. I won't name them. Um, but they've oh, been quite, yeah. <laughs> they've been been on, quite yeah. a, par a party animal in their day. And upstairs was this very restrained 18th century house. And they said, we're thinking about changing the spa. And I thought, it's where's not the spa? Job, <laughs> anyway, through the bookcase down the stairs was this club, which had obviously been used for parties in the 60s and 70s. And there were hot tubs and steam rooms and oh colorful God. lights and statues and everything. And they said, what should we do? And I said, I think leave it as it is. <laughs> <laughs> Museum. Yeah. I don't yeah. think clients need reining in, but they need directing and editing. Yeah. I think that's a really yeah. good point. You know, people can come with lots of kind of ideas, Not but actually they don't know they yeah. don't yeah. know how to put yeah. it together, and yeah. it's you know, and so you just have to sort of yeah. step back yeah. and. Well, that's why we need an interior designer. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, also, you've got to deal with the people you're commissioning the things from, which might not be something that is conventional. So if you're commissioning a mad carpet or a piece of furniture, <coughs> you've got, you're the one relaying that brief to the artist man and that's, that's quite a challenging position. And managing expectations yeah. once it's installed. Exactly. And, and do you think that um, we are inspired by um, things like, you know, we've just had The Crown on television, had Bridgerton on television with all the, the opulence. Is, is does that kind of filter through to what clients are asking for? I'd be more inspired by Tony Duquette or Diana Vreeland's apartment than Bridgerton, which was sort of sugar-coated candy pastel. Yeah. It was a full <laughs> fab, but, but yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for years, you know, there was quite often, I'm sure we've all had it, the Soho House brief, you know, everyone ah, wanted yes. it, you know, <laughs> wasn't there? And then, yeah. and of course, Annabelle's, you know, so there's always, I yeah, think it tends to be more interior. I don't think anyone's come to me kind of inspired by Bridgeton. a TV series. Yeah, no. exactly. Well, some, some of those things are yeah. crown. Oh, like Downton. That. Yeah, and that period, I mean, the, the period when they were doing the Tony Armstrong Jones and Princess Margaret apartment at Kensington Palace, that was quite a cool, restrained yes. 60s interior 
And I think that part, which I think was, was it season two, I'm not sure, it's the Jeremy Fry and all of that. And I have to claim a little knowledge of that because I used to live in a house with one of the children, so I heard the whole <laughs> sordid story. But, um, but that, that sort of, um, that was those fabulous. interiors were great. Yeah. And they, yeah. they did sum up the six. Whoever oh, the did Halston, the set. Was the Halston uh, Netflix series was yeah. just the most immaculate. Mm. And yeah. things uh, like yeah, 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 yeah. Just fantastic. Amazing, yeah. And the, the Queen's Gambit, which was a yeah. whole stylish yeah. Yeah. thing and recreation. Yeah. And, and people do get inspired by film, I think, and set. Definitely. And, yeah, so just not Bridgeton, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> 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 and, and what about, um, how, how about creating that feeling of exuberance rather than just thing, you know, putting things on the walls? How, how is it that you create an ambience of and make something joyful for your clients? Well, I think, I think it's this layering. I think, yes, yeah. it's the, I think it's, yes, it's the finishes and the materials. It's also the furniture and the fabrics. It's also the smell in the room. You know, we yeah. spent a long time at Albany thinking about what, what do we want this, what does this, should this smell of? And lighting is. And lighting, uh, absolutely. Light, yeah. You know, lighting absolutely key. So it's all of those elements and the AV and the you know what is the what is the sound and the music and the you know it's it's pulling the whole thing together. I guess I think it's atmosphere that's going to be the first thing that captures you when you walk into a room. Yeah. You're not going to walk in and go, oh, that sofa looks comfortable, or yeah. it, you know, you're going to think mm -hmm. it smells good, the lighting's beautiful, yeah. the color.